Hello, and welcome to Sleep Unplugged with Dr. Chris Winner. This is episode nine. Why aren't more people talking about school start times? I want to welcome you to the podcast if you're new. Very excited to be here and really excited to talk about this topic in particular. It's been on my radar since the planning stages of the podcast. And since I'm sort of making this episode the back to school episode, I thought this was an appropriate topic. And it's back to school time for a lot of people, which means the days and nights of social jet lag where your kids are staying up and sleeping in late are going to come crashing to an end for many families, which is a big time of stress and anxiety for many. One of my favorite sleep researchers, Roxanne Pritchard, uses the week before school starts uh, to take her kids camping because she feels like that's a great way to get their little circadian clocks realigned. I personally just dropped my youngest off to college, and it's just a big emotional and difficult transition time. You're getting their bedroom set up in their dorm if that's what your kids are doing and hoping that some of the messages that you gave to them about good nutrition, good sleep, good study habits, don't procrastinate, uh, sunk in and are carried with them to their next phase of life. So school start times are really important to me. I think they're important to a lot of sleep researchers. And it's definitely uh, an important topic and one where I'm really excited to get into. So before we get going, a couple of corrections from uh, the last episode. Uh, very quickly, I was referencing a sleep doctor that I just couldn't remember who kind of coined the phrase sleep alliance, which I think is such a better phrase than sleep divorce. Just want to give a shout out to Sleep Doctor Meredith. She's at, at Sleep Doctor Murr. You can follow her, her on Instagram. She's a great follow and has really good suggestions for sleep. Uh, also, inadvertently uh, referenced Wendy Troxel's book, uh, sharing the covers, uh, Every Couple's Guide to Better Sleep as Between the Sheets, um, which she said it was a consideration, but maybe a little bit too racy for her topic. So I want to uh, make sure I correct those two things. Uh, viewer mail. We got a great uh, question from Little Little White Dog Properties LLC. So Little White Dog Properties, I guess, will rent you a place in Maine, and if you have a pet, your pet is absolutely welcome. Uh, and she says, I can totally relate to two of these trendy sleep terms. So we talked in our last episode about trendy sleep terms like sleep divorce and revenge bedtime procrastination. She says, I'm a fantastic sleeper and like to learn little nuggets to help me uh, sleep even better. But she was really concerned about the fact that she really, so there is a train going by. I'm actually in Hudson, New York, uh, recording this podcast. And so apparently next to Hud Hudson, New York, there is a train. I just wanted to mention that she said that uh, she feels like she wants to be brainless by herself but really doesn't understand when it's going to be, it's best for her to do it and how she can avoid that procrastination. You know, one tip that I remember uh, an individual talking about that seemed to work really well for her was creating timers. So when timers went off, it was a reminder to her that um, it was time for her to go to bed. And so I think we often think about alarms we set to wake ourselves up, which are very important. I think setting an alarm uh, to remind you to go to bed is important. And as I said in the previous episode, making sure that you prioritize that time in the evening to give yourself uh, that space where you're not working, but you're also not sleeping. I think that's a very important time for us to, to prioritize. So thanks for checking in with the show. I appreciate your support. So let's talk about the topic uh, in terms of uh, school start times. And I think that all begins with defining how much sleep a child needs. And when I say child, in this episode, we're really talking about school-aged children. So when you look at the National Sleep Foundation, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, they're recommending you know eight to 10 hours for the school-aged child, for the older you know teen, high school student, seven to nine. But that range for the school-aged child could be 7 to 11 hours. For teens, it could be up to 11 hours. 
So when we say seven, eight, nine, that's the middle of the bell curve distribution. And just understand that there are certainly children who need more sleep than that. So what we're really looking towards is how can we assure that school age kids, middle schoolers, high schoolers, elementary school kids are getting the requisite amount of sleep that they need because study after study right now says when you start looking at that high school population, it's about 25% that are hitting their target. So 75% of high schoolers out there may not be getting adequate access to the sleep that they need. And this was a big reason why I wrote my book, The Rested Child, why your tired, wired, or irritable child may have a sleep disorder and how to help. It's covering both intrinsic sleep problems, as we've talked about in previous episodes, but also extrinsic problems where you're not getting access to the sleep time that you need uh, because of extracurricular activities, because of homework, um, because of family issues and dynamics. And this is very important um, to, to topics to look at, that sleep disorders do not just exist in the adult population. They are alive and well in kids. Um, I mentioned my other book, the, the Sleep Solution, Why You're Tired, Sleep Solution, uh, Why Your Sleep May Be Broken, How to Fix It. Um, my book, The Rest of the Child, just came out in paperback. So if you're interested in that, it is available now uh, in that format. If you want to follow me, just want to mention my social media handle, handles up front. Twitter and Instagram and TikTok are Dr. Chris Winter, D-R-C-H-R-I-S-W-I-N-T-E-R. Appreciate the follow, appreciate any comments, feedback, questions, uh, criticism of the show. You're welcome to DM me on those platforms. So we've got school-aged children, middle schoolers, high schoolers who need somewhere between eight to 10, hour, 10 hours of sleep, maybe more. What is threatening the sleep of children? When you look at extrinsic threats to children's sleep, what are they? In my opinion, there are two that stand out well above the rest. They are technology, which will be a future episode of the show. Um, as soon as I figure out how to deal with technology interrupting the sleep of our children, I'm going to record that episode immediately. It is a tough problem, uh, largely because the second biggest threat to our kids getting the sleep that they need is probably schools. And I say that um, with the utmost respect um, and admiration of the people who teach in our schools, run our schools. Both my parents were school teachers. My wife's a school teacher. I considered teaching. I think it's an amazing profession, um, really dedicated, important. Um, we should have the highest respect for these individuals. But the school system is definitely a situation that threatens the sleep health of our children. And we know this. And when you combine sleep technology and the school and you bring them into one, it becomes even more problematic. And what I mean by that is when I was going to school, there really was no technology. We had a calculator. Um, at some point it became solar powered, which was really cool. Could remember some formulas, but that was really about it. When we read a book, it was a textbook uh, or a novel. Um, everything was done in notebooks. Like there was no technology really in the school. Remember the little plastic sheets they would put on the overhead projector? I mean, that was my era. So as technology has sort of come into the picture, it becomes increasingly difficult for students to separate themselves from, te from technology and really difficult for parents to separate technology from the kids because as soon as you step away from the child on the laptop writing their essay, they can easily just switch a screen back to the game they were playing or the video they were watching. So the linkage between these things has become very problematic. And with COVID, I think it's even amplified that even more. And, and we'll certainly talk about that. So we'll cover electronics and technology in a, in a different episode. What I want to focus on now is school itself. The time your children are spending in school and what that does to their sleep. And there have been plenty of studies looking at this. Um, going back, um, there's a researcher, Lisa Meltzer, um, who's out in Colorado, in Denver, and she's done some real important work. She's a PhD who sort of looks at sleep health and, and, and medical disorders in children and you know, looked at a study uh, showing that 
you know, sleep uh, in high school students and in middle school students is absolutely threatened. Um, and when you look at the number of these kids who are getting their target amount of sleep, it's simply not there. Um, you know, like I said, maybe 25%. So that has caused a lot of movement within the sleep world um, and, and, and sort of the, the peripheral medical community around the sleep world. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that uh, bodies uh, of individuals have come together and said, look, we believe that it is extremely important for children to get the requisite amount of sleep. And we believe that that requisite amount of sleep has got to be at least you know, eight to 10 hours. But we also believe based upon looking at studies of timings of school, that it's very important for students not to begin school uh, in the middle school and high school years before 8.30. That's sort of the magic number. And there's studies to back that up. You know, there, there have been studies looking at what is the ideal time for your student to start their school day. So let's take out all the peripheral that we'll talk about in just a second and just answer the question, what's the best time to start school for your middle school or high schooler? Well, those studies sort of vary, but generally fall within the hours of 8.30 to 10 o'clock. Uh, Paul Kelly was a researcher who actually did word pairing studies um, with students and showed that, you know, when you looked at how they did at 10 o'clock versus two o'clock, they did better later. And he felt like 10 o'clock was the magic number, even though it was really impractical for a lot of reasons. Um, but when you look at it now, 830 is sort of the number. So I think that we're sort of looking for if we could get everybody of that age group starting school at 8.30 or later, we'd, we'd be doing a lot. And studies would back that up that shows that it really increases the number of kids who have access to the appropriate amount of sleep that they need. So what we have now is the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we have the uh, National Association of School Nurses, uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine, um, the American uh, PTA Association, the American Medical Association, have all even the American Academy of Sleep Technologists have all put out statements saying, we fully support and believe that kids should be able to start school in that age group at 8.30 or later and feel that is best for their emotional health. It's best for their learning. Um, it, it's, it's best for everything. I mean, it, there have been studies that show that their weight is improved, their diet is better, there's less drug abuse, smoking, caffeine use. Um, and a good buddy of mine, Robert Verona, uh, who was in Eastern Virginia and went down to South Carolina for a little bit and retired, showed that even automobile accidents, if you can just push that school start time a little bit later, those accidents in young people dramatically improve uh, the, the numbers of those. And, and, and who wouldn't want that? So we've got every conceivable body loosely associated with sleep, basically saying, look, got to start school times 8.30 or later. Uh, and all these earlier school start times have, have got to go away. So what, what is the argument against them? So I would say at this point, there is no argument against starting schools later from the child's health and educational point of view. There is no counter argument. And, and, and it's even getting stronger as we go. And I'll mention that in a minute. But so, so why, why not do it? Well, at this point, it really has to do with a lot of peripheral things, school busing, parents in their work, et cetera. But what the biggest driver probably is, is after school work for children and sports. And there have been several counties that have come out and basically said, look, the biggest reason why we can't adjust school start times is because of high school athletics. That is a big driver. And just like everything else, even within the adult world, sports has a big voice in terms of what goes on. So when you take all of those things out, a kid being, you know, getting off at school at three o'clock and trying to go to work and, and, and earn some money, uh, going to a soccer game, traveling, et cetera. When you take all that out, there really is no argument for continuing to have kids 
start school early. There is, there's not a study that I'm aware of out there that shows any benefit to the child. In fact, all of them show absolute worsening of emotional health and scholastic achievement. And even getting into things like uh, suspensions for bad behavior, uh, the number of failing grades goes down. There was a, there was a study in Massachusetts, a, a school district in Massachusetts said, look, we want to look at this personally within our own school district and make a decision. They made the decision to start school later, an hour later. They went from 725 to 825. And within a very short period of time, within one to two years, said we see 53% drop in failing grades, 40% drop in students getting Ds and Fs. Uh, we have a hundred. We had 166 school suspensions prior to the change, after only 19. And even the people who were against it were largely for it within a very short period of time. Even if something 90% of parents said they could see a huge difference in the kids that they were living with. So we've got overwhelming evidence that this is a good thing. And then COVID happened. And, and that's really what I want to get into because as awful as COVID is, it provided a very unique and widespread look at what happens if we do an experiment where we allow kids to sleep later. And so and it's interesting because I, you know, many of you, I'm sure, went through this in one way or another. I'm the parent of three children. All three of my kids were affected by COVID in different ways. And there was some unique things going on with my kids. Both of, All of my kids were sort of in their later high school years, college years when this happened. I happened to have one son who was a swimmer, one who was a rower. So they were not only getting up to go to school early, but they were getting up really early to do their sport, which immediately disappeared when COVID happened. So not only were they getting the benefit of not having to go to school early, they didn't have their school athletic, you know, event happening either. And you could look at that and think, oh, wow, you know, I'm sure that's very healthy for them to get up and swim for three hours. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Jury's still out on that one, in my opinion. But regardless, all of a sudden, instead of getting up at 4.50 every morning and driving to a pool, they were sleeping until nine. And, and, and what you see is study after study big studies, big population studies coming out showing that the COVID experiment, and that is in quotes, revealed a lot of very interesting things. Um, there was a UK study uh, in Sleep Advances of about, surveyed about 17,000 students and showed that they were getting almost an extra hour of sleep. Were they going to bed later? Yes. Were they getting up later? Yes. And that benefited them by almost an extra hour of sleep. There was a, a BMC public health uh, article from 2021, 3,265 students um, went from getting 8.88 hours, so 8.88 hours of sleep during the lockdown. When schools reopened and they went back in person, this was in Shanghai, China, their average sleep time dropped to 7.7. .7. So 21% of individuals were getting insufficient sleep, but prior to going back, uh, I'm sorry, 21% of individuals were getting insufficient sleep during the lockdown. When they went back, that number went up to 64% of students were getting insufficient sleep. There was another study in Zurich of about 3,600 students showed that they were getting about 75 more minutes of sleep, hour and 15 more minutes of sleep during the lockdown without. So we go back to Lisa Meltzer, who did a lot of, did some really seminal work um, prior to COVID. She had a study that came out uh, that basically said, look, let's divide students up um, in terms of what is their school experience during COVID. So we can look at the individuals who are in, in class, who are in in-person in, in, in school, Individuals who are doing synchronous learning. So you were at home on Zoom, but you were doing your learning at the same time of everybody else. If school starts at eight o'clock or 8.30, you're on Zoom at eight or 8.30. And then there was asynchronous learning, meaning 
we're going to post a lesson online, do it whenever you want to write the essay, do the math homework whenever you want to. And then we'll talk about it during the next you know, recorded class. And what they showed was an incremental increase in the amount of sleep the kids were getting. And what was fascinating to me was looking at the number of students that were getting sufficient opportunity to sleep. It went from something like 37% uh, of individuals were getting enough sleep in high school in the in-person. When you switch to synchronous, that went up to 57%, asynchronous, 81%. And it was really just study after study showing uh, Lisa's study also showed that high school students were getting about four hours more sleep per week. Middle school, school students, two and a half. Extra hours of sleep per week multiplied over the entire school year is a massive amount of sleep. I mean, I always look at the athletes that we work with and I'm trying to think, how can I get this baseball team or this NBA team to get 15, maybe 20 minutes of of extra sleep a week. <laughs> These are the numbers that I'm trying to worry. How can I convince this team to get 30 extra minutes of sleep per week? And in these situations, we're getting hours of extra sleep per week. I mean, think about this. Every two weeks, this high school student gets an extra night of sleep, essentially. Think about your own child every two weeks pulling an all-nighter. Every second Sunday night, you got to pull an all-nighter. And just what that would do to not only their scholastic achievement, but their emotional health. And when we think about COVID and what's come out of COVID, this is fantastically interesting, but it's only telling one half of the picture. The other half of COVID is the dramatic increase in psychological issues, anxiety, depression that has come out of the situation. It is still very much ongoing. Just think about how important it would be for your child to be getting that much more sleep. And so the real trick is, and when you go back to that UK study I was mentioning about 17,000 students, um, one of the things they showed was, and it was a confounder for the study, was yes, they're getting more, they're getting more sleep. But we're also seeing this rise in emotional and psychological problems and poor health and how can we tease out because we don't believe nobody believes that oh because your child is getting more sleep that's the reason why this is going on no it's because of covid and all the terrible things that went along with that so what we're looking at now is how can we create a structure within education that allows us to not only support sleep with later school start times, uh, abilities to be more flexible with our learning, ways that we can really look out for the restfulness and the sleep health of our children, but also have the in-person connection and all the social support that goes along with the school that we're used to and have that be a part of the picture as well too. And so as I think about these types of things, I think that we will see as we move forward that there are ways that we can address a lot of these issues. So what's come out of all this is an organization, Start Schools, Start, start School Later um, is, is the organization that has been set up as a separate entity that is supported by sleep doctors, pediatricians, psychologists, there's all kinds of input going into this wonderful organization. You can follow them at Start School Later on Instagram and Twitter. And what they're really doing is saying, look, we have lots of things that we need to accomplish and address going forward. But one achievable thing that we can all not only agree on, but we have a, we have a solution and a way to move forward is let's try to get all the schools starting at least 8.30 or later. And we've got ideas and ways you can get around the busing issues and the parent issues and whatnot. And when you look at the people who've done it, A, they're successful doing it. B, the people who were the loudest voices speaking out against it are often for it very quickly. And, you know, so one of the things that's always interesting to me is people say, well, look, that's just, you know, if the busing is the way it is, that just means that the younger kids are going to have to go to school early 
and the older kids were just were just flip flopping. Yes, that's exactly what they did in Massachusetts. They they allowed the the older the middle schools middle school and the high school students to go to school later have the later school start time. It did mean a slightly earlier start time for the elementary school students. But when you look at the biology of the situation, they often have a much greater capacity for that switch. As we start to move later and later in our school age years, even moving into college, the average teen of that age group has a much stronger delay in their circadian rhythm. They want to go to bed late. They want to get up later. And what we're trying to do with this movement is essentially match up or synchronize their education to when they're most likely to benefit from it. And one of the things I tell students and teachers all the time and parents is, look, if you've got a child who is in a school system that starts early and you've identified your child as somebody who is a night owl, we call that a phase delay. And there's all kinds of assessments that you can do. And I write about them in my book, The Rest of Child, Why You're Tired, Why Your Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help, where you can sort of assess your child as being a morning person or a night owl and walk right into the school and say, look, my son's a night owl. He can't take calculus first period at eight o'clock or 745 or whenever the school starts. And if the school doesn't have an option for you, maybe it'd be better for your child to take that class through a local community college where they can take it later, closer to the time where they're optimal. So all these things are important. And that, and that Kelly article I was mentioning earlier was called Synchronize education to adolescent biology. That's that's what we're talking about here. And organizations like Start School Later deserve your attention. Uh, this topic deserves your help and your input. And it starts at a local level. So if you're listening to this and you've got kids and you're one of those schools that starts early, be vocal about it because believe me, the science is on your side. There is no scientific debate about what is best for your child. It is absolutely best for your middle schooler or high schooler to start their school at 830 or later. And we could bring in homeschooling into this conversation, which is sort of a completely different direction. But when you look at that data, the children who can literally start school whenever they feel like it, whenever the, the teacher or their parent, whoever feels like starting it, that biology synchronization is out of this world um, and, and really important um, for, for children if you have the capacity to do that. But we shouldn't have to homeschool our kids to get a school start time at 8.30 or later. So my homework for all of you listeners is to follow Start Schools later Find out about school start times in your area if they start early, if they're not linking up to the biology of your students. Talk about it with your school. Figure out what's going to be best for them. Be vocal. Make school starts start times later. That's it. Uh, really appreciate your support. I'm really happy to have this, this episode in the can. I think it's a very important issue. Um, look forward to our 10th episode next week. Uh, please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast wherever you're listening to it. Uh, if you have time uh, on your uh, commute in the morning and you're not driving, a review would be most appreciated. Please follow me on my social media channels. That's Dr. Chris Winter, as well as uh, on Twitter, as well as Instagram and TikTok. Uh, books, The Sleep Solution, and The Rest of Child available wherever books are sold. And again, The Rest of Child just came out last week in paperback. Really appreciate the support of that paperback. Uh, I, can, I can see that you guys are, are, are really helping it out and I appreciate that. So until next uh, next Monday, uh, this is Dr. Chris Winter, uh, Sleep, Unplugged, Sleep Unplugged Podcast. Everybody sleep well.